Um, it's our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Apaya to, um, to speak to us today. She comes with a, to us with a different perspective um, than our other speakers. So she is um, division chief um, of the generalist division and she is trained as an adolescent or peds and adolescent gynecologist. She's also director of fertility preservation at um, the University of Colorado. And I was just looking up her bio on the Colorado page and it said at the bottom, did you know that Dr. Apaya also lobbies uh, politicians to get coverage for fertility preservation? So she's, she's doing it all and wearing many hats. So uh, welcome. Thank you, Wendy. Thank yeah. you, Divya. And thank you all for attending. It is my pleasure to speak with you today on practical aspects of ovarian tissue queer preservation in the pediatric population. I do have one financial disclosure. I serve as a consultant for a pharmaceutical advisory company. My goal at the end of this talk is that you will be able to identify appropriate candidates for ovarian tissue cryopreservation, explain technical and surgical aspects of ovarian tissue freezing, describe collaboration as a regional OTC referral center, and be able to discuss considerations for ovarian tissue transplantation. This is the outline that I will go through. So first, indications and risk stratification, OTC as clinical care, some of the surgical and laboratory considerations, processes for collaboration as a regional center, and then some advances in ovarian tissue transplantation. So in terms of indications for ovarian tissue cryopreservation, the diagnoses that are amenable to OTC continue to grow year after year. Malignant conditions remain the largest group of diagnoses for which OTC is utilized. Criteria include patients for whom there is insufficient time for ovarian stimulation and retrieval, pre and post pubertal patients who are at high risk of gonadal failure, and patients who have not yet received high gonadotoxic doses of chemotherapy, which implies that patients who have received some chemotherapy are still candidates for ovarian tissue cryopreservation. Non-malignant disorders are increasingly being treated with stem cell transplant, which places patients at high risk and therefore amenable to OTC. And similarly, individuals with gender and sex diversity are requesting OTC more and more often for fertility preservation. So this includes patients with mixed gonadal dysgenesis who are going to undergo gonadectomy as part of their clinical care and who desire to have a conversation about fertility preservation. And then lastly, patients with genetic predisposition to accelerated follicular loss, such as patients with Turner syndrome, Turner mosaicism, and patients with galactosemia or other diagnoses that are going to result in this follicular loss. Alkylator and radiation therapies confer the highest risk of fertility, therefore risk stratification to determine eligibility for fertility preservation therapies including ovarian tissue cryopreservation are based on these therapies. So the cyclophosphamide equivalent dose score was developed by Dan Green and colleagues at St. Jude's, and it is a calculation used to compare different alkylated therapies and combination therapy. So cyclophosphamide is the standard alkylated therapy against which all other alkylators are compared. And because patients typically receive combinations such as melphalan plus cyphosphamide plus busulfan plus cyclophosphamide, there was a need to be able to equate those different alkylators to cyclophosphamide. And so we use the CED scoring system to determine what that um, dose is. It is a simple calculator that you can find online and you will just put in the total cumulative dose of the different alkylators and then it will give you a dose scoring system. In 2020, the Pediatric Initiative Network of the Oncofertility Consortium, of which I'm a member, developed and published this risk, risk stratification system to better describe risk. Historically, the terms used were low risk, moderate risk, and high level risk. And that describes less than 20%, 30 to 80%, and greater than 80% risk of acute ovarian failure. 
And so with the new risk stratification system, we changed the terms to minimally increased risk, significantly increased risk, and high level of increased risk. And the impetus for redefining these categories was twofold. First, we wanted to illustrate that even patients receiving this lower risk are still at some risk. So the previous category of low risk kind of conferred that these patients, there were no concerns, but depending on the patient's baseline ovarian reserve, there could still be some risk. Additionally, we wanted to stratify risk by prepubertal and pubertal status. The reason is that, as you know, prepubertal patients are going to have a higher number of follicles and therefore will be able to tolerate higher doses of chemotherapy and radiation before experiencing harm. So in ex as an example, prepubertal girls who receive a CED of eight to 12 grams per meter squared are considered sig at significantly increased risk of acute ovarian failure compared to pubertal girls who may only receive up to eight grams per meter squared before experiencing the same level of risk. In terms of radiation exposure, prepubertal girls may receive up to 15 grays of radiation to the ovary before experiencing this risk, whereas pubertal girls may only receive up to 10 grays. Those patients at, high, at the highest level of increased risk are those prepubertal girls receiving greater than 12 grams, pubertal girls receiving greater than eight grams, Alkylated therapy prior to stem cell transplant, where patients are receiving high doses of multiple alkylating agents, as well as total body irradiation, are going to confer some of the highest risk. And we see this risk both in patients receiving myeloablative and this reduced intensity regimen. In terms of hypothalamic injury, we know that patients who receive greater than or equal to 40 grays are going to have irreversible injury and experience hypogonadotropic hypogonadism dictating the need for gonadotropins for um, fertility. And so we recommend fertility preservation for any patient at significantly increased risk or higher. So in terms of the evidence for ovarian tissue cryopreservation, the first live birth after OTC was reported in 2004 by Donna and colleagues. And they describe a 36 year old patient who was menopausal after treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma. And they, in this situation, they grafted the tissue back to the atrophic remaining ovary. So typically only one ovary is removed and there's another ovary that remains. So they transplanted the tissue back to that atrophic ovary. And after several months, this patient experienced spontaneous menses and then conceived spontaneously. And then in 2005, Mero and colleagues described a 28-year-old patient who um, experienced premature ovarian failure after treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Again, the tissue was grafted back to the remaining ovary, and this patient actually underwent modified in vitro fertilization and then conceived and delivered a live, a live a full-term infant. So the question then remained whether or not ovarian tissue cryopreservation was feasible in children. So these were both adult women, and so whether or not this was feasible in children remained debated. And Demetri and colleagues demonstrated a successful live birth after autograft of ovarian tissue in a patient from whom the tissue was harvested at age 13. So this was the first child that had, had tissue harvested and then conceived. The patient has sickle cell disease and underwent stem cell transplant, but had the ovary removed prior to. Um, she underwent pubertal induction with exogenous HRT and then had the tissue transplanted back in her 20s and then conceived and delivered spontaneously. Then the question remained whether or not prepubertal patients would have the same success rate. So adults, children, now prepubertal children. So this was the first successful delivery of a patient from whom the ovary was removed as a nine-year-old child. And this was prior to stem cell transplant for beta thalassemia. This patient subsequently had the tissue transplanted in adulthood and then also conceived. And so we know the technology works for both prepubertal and postpubertal women. And then I just highlight these two references here to show you that there are some investigators who have actually transplanted tissue retrieved from prepubertal children back to those children for pubertal induction. So 10 year old with sickle cell disease and a nine year old with urine sarcoma, the tissue was harvested and then used for pubertal induction, and they have, did not yet report the live birth rate. But so we know that this, this uh, modality of ovarian tissue freezing is both feasible for fertility 
and hormone induction therapy for patients who are children and adults. So Duncan and colleagues through the National Physicians Cooperative of the Uncle Fertility Consortium published some of the early studies on the viability of ovarian follicles in ovarian tissue harvested from children. So in this public publication, they assessed 24 patients status post ovarian tissue cryopreservation. And these patients had either received no previous chemotherapy, low risk chemotherapy or high risk treatment for both oncologic and non-oncologic diagnoses. So almost half of the patients underwent removal of cortical strips and some of the patients underwent oophrectomy. And what they were able to show is that there were growing follicles in these patients who had not received any treatment. But importantly, they were able to show that in all samples, so patients who had received no treatment, low risk chemotherapy and high risk chemotherapy, they were able to show the presence of primordial and early activated primary follicles. And so from this data, we began to understand that even after some chemotherapy, ovarian tissue cryopreservation was a feasible option. And these studies have been replicated and we now know that this is safe. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So worldwide, there have been over 200 children born after ovarian tissue cryopreservation and transplantation. And this number is actually an underestimate because this number is from a series of 285 women from five centers in Europe. It does not actually include the American data. But what we know that is that there have been over 8,000 tissues frozen and over 1,100 tissues transplanted back. There have been patients both in the prepubertal range and in their mid thirties who have undergone the procedure and successfully delivered with a delivery rate of 29 to 41%. And with egg freezing and embryo cryopreservation, we're looking at 50 to 60 to 70%. And so this is a very reasonable delivery rate. And this has incurred in patients who have conceived spontaneously, so through intercourse and through IVF. And the study actually shows that there's a higher life birth rate with natural conception than with IVF. And that ovarian tissue cryopreservation was not contraindicated after low risk chemotherapy. So again, in their study, they were able to show that even patients who have received some chemotherapy went on to have a live birth. And in their study, they also showed that hormone function persists an average of five years per graft. There are some studies that suggest that the graft life may be longer for seven to 10 years, um, but in their hands, they show five years per graft. So I wanna turn now to some of the surgical and laboratory aspects of ovarian tissue cryopreservation in children and young adults. So typically laparoscopy is the approach that we want to take for these patients to minimize the risk of injury and to minimize a delay in going forward with their cancer treatments. However, we will perform laparotomy for this procedure if the patient is already undergoing a laparotomy for oncologic resection. We always try to bundle ovarian tissue cryopreservation with cancer-related procedures, such as a port line placement, uh, Broviac, or even bone marrow biopsies if the patient is having that under anesthesia. And this just minimizes the number of anesthetics that the patient undergoes. And port placement for the procedure is typically determined by patient size and age. So the smaller the patient, the smaller the abdominal area, and so typically it is recommended, and this is what pediatric surgeons typically do, they place the ports on one side or the other. We usually will use a five millimeter port for these for infants because the ovary is smaller, and then five millimeter ports for the operating instruments. We can also use a 10 millimeter depending on um, the surgeon's preference. For pre-adolescents, as they become a bit larger, the abdominal area is a bit larger, we will typically do a suprapubic port and then place an upper quadrant port to the right or the left. The right ovary is typically more accessible than the left ovary because the left ovary can be obstructed by the sigmoid colon. And so we typically will go for the right ovary, but of course we're surgeons, we can do either one, but that just makes the surgery a little bit shorter and less risk for potential bowel injuries. As our patients get older, we may then use just one right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant port, and again, 10 millimeter ports for the umbilicus to remove the ovary. We really don't wanna struggle with removing the ovary from the abdomen that damages the cortex, it damages any follicles um, that could be in the cortex. So we really wanna make sure that we stretch that fascia 
and or use a 10 millimeter port. In terms of the technical aspects, we typically will remove an entire ovary because we are performing this procedure in patients who are, at, who are at significantly increased risk or that high level of increased risk. And this just allows for more cortical tissue for future use. And then we leave the remaining ovary. The complication rate for laparoscopy, even in the setting of a cancer diagnosis is still less than 1%. We select the ovary without cyst or corpus luteum formation, and that's because the cyst or the corpus luteum may alter the integrity of the cortex. It will thin that cortical area, which makes dissection of the medullary tissue more difficult. And so we typically will do that. And so this is where role of ovarian suppression comes in. We know the patient is going to undergo ovarian tissue prior preservation. We would rather there not be a cyst so that we can A, pick the right ovary, because it's more easily accessible. And so we don't have to have tissue that's disrupted. So providing these patients or giving these patients norethindrone acetate or some sort of hormone therapy to suppress the HPO access would be prudent prior to performing the OTC. We sometimes don't have that sort of time, but in our patients who are undergoing stem cell transplant, we do. And so this is an opportunity. Similarly, for patients who undergo ovarian stimulation prior to OTC, trying to suppress um, that cis formation is going to be helpful if possible. It can take several weeks to achieve that. We want to minimize the manipulation of the ovary. And so typically we will grasp the uterovarian ligament first and use a no touch technique, which was described by Christine Corkum and Aaron Rowell at Northwestern. And so then we will transect the uterovarian ligament and then go down the mesoovarium to the IP. And traditionally, it was very important to follow this process because we wanted to maintain the blood supply as long as possible to minimize the, the time to tissue processing. We now know that the tissue can be transported 24 hours. And so that technique of uterovarian ligament to mesoovarium to IP is not as important, but it does make the surgery easier and a little bit faster. There are some investigators who will transect the fallopian tube at the isthmus of the uterus and take the tube and the ovary in infants and prepubertal girls due to the distance between the mesovarium and the ovary and the tube. So because that distance is narrow, there is a concern that there will be injury to both the fallopian tube and or the ovary with trying to dissect through that mesovarium and so they'll take both. I'll show you some data that shows that, um, and I've actually already presented it, that we know the spontaneous conception is going to have a higher pregnancy rate. So if we take the fallopian tube, then we are going to alter the ability for spontaneous conception. The other tube is in place. And so due to migration of the oocyte to the other tube, that may not be an option, but we really do want to give these patients the most options in the future and not predispose them to IVF. So there's something to consider. Some investigators will perform cortical biopsies if the patient is at significantly increased risk, but not at that highest level of increased risk. And if there's a thought that there may be some resumption of ovarian function, then they may do a cortical biopsy for someone who may not have time to freeze eggs and wants to do something for their fertility. So again, we're going to select the ovary without a cyst. We're going to minimize injury, although quite frankly, we're cutting directly into the ovary. So one could argue that any technique is fine. We use cold scissors to transect longitudinally to obtain as much cortex as possible, and then try to minimize injury to the remaining ovarian bed with cautery and some anticoagulation products. And again, the idea is that this allows potential recovery of that ovary. But again, the other ovary is in place. And so is this completely necessary if there are two ovaries in place, perhaps not. We recently had a patient who had had one ovary removed for a cancer diagnosis. And so we did perform a partial oophorectomy of the remaining ovary so as not to remove both of our ovaries. And so typically once we remove the ovary, we remove the cortex from the medulla because the cortex contains the follicles and we're not yet able to freeze an entire ovary due to the, the width of the ovary. We remove, we then transect the ovary into strips, and we try to do this as thinly as possible to allow the choir protectants to get through the wall of the ovary. And then we place the ovarian tissue into these cryovials, 
Currently, the slow freeze technique is considered standard. There's some investigators who use vitrification, but is not yet considered standard across institutions, and the tissue may be stored indefinitely. So in terms of then how we process the tissue and whether or not we do it at our institution or with the collaborating center, it's important to have a sterile setup for this because remember the tissue is going to be transplanted back into a patient. And so we are going to make sure that we have a sterile hood that has this high efficiency particulate, particulate absorption filters and laminar flow where the air comes through and comes out either vertically or horizontally um, to minimize contamination of the tissue. This is one of the slow freeze slow rate freezers that we've used in the past. They're now smaller and a little bit more chic. Um, and within this freezer are these chambers where we place a cryovial. And this is just showing the technique of seeding. So you place the tissue in the cryovial, the media is there, and then this swab contains um, the liquid nitrogen. And then you just touch it at the interface of the liquid and the air, and that starts the freezing process. And then you continue there. The tissue, once frozen, is then stored in liquid nitrogen until it's ready to be transported to a long-term storage facility. If you are not processing the tissue on your own at your institution, then transporting, transporting the tissue to a regional referral center is important. We currently are not processing the tissue at our institution. We hope to do that in several months, but in the interim, we send our tissue to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center with Kyle Orwig's group. And this is the doer, the transport doer, which is very small. And we place the specimen cup with the sample, which contains the media and the tissue. There's a temperature log that we turn on at the time that the tissue is placed into the, the doer. There is this felt fabric around the tissue to prevent freezing against this ice pack. And then there are packing peanuts to, to prevent a lot of movement of the sterile specimen cup because it can rupture depending on um, how what the transit is like. And then another larger ice pack here. On the day of the surgery, the surgical team will obtain the doer and the media from the external site. And we typically order the media from the, um, the, the our referring center and have it with us. And we always have the doer with us as well. And we just bring it to the OR. Typically the port or central line placement will occur first as the cleanest procedure. And then infectious disease testing, if it is being performed, will be performed by anesthesia because again, these are children and we wanna minimize any discomfort. And in the past, we've sent a purple tube of blood for any future testing that needs to be done. We no longer um, do that, but this was uh, our practice. Not all centers require infectious disease testing, but the purpose of that is that if the patient decides to have another individual or surrogate have the tissue transplanted into that person, then we need to make sure that there's no HIV or uh, syphilis or any infectious disease at that time. So that's why we do infectious disease testing. It's no longer mandatory, but most of us still recommend it. When we remove the ovary, we call out the time that the ovary is transected because we want to make sure we know how long the ovary has been separated from the blood supply. And then we have our pathologist evaluate the ovary. So we take the ovary to pathology. They are going to assess it in that sterile hood. They will look at the tissue grossly, perform a biopsy, do a histologic assessment of that biopsy. And then we take the remaining tissue, they'll bivalve it and place it in the media so that the media bathes the entire ovary, both the medullary component and the cortex. And then we will hand that over in the media, in the doer to our courier, who will then transport the, cur the tissue either via air to UPMC or vehicle if you have an REI center in your, your area that's going to process this tissue. And then the patient can proceed with their cancer treatment within uh, one to five days. It can occur that day. They can start chemotherapy that day. There are some conditions our sickle cell patients, when they are receiving their conditioning prior to their transplant, they tend to have a reaction that mimics infection. So 
our, our, our sickle cell doctors prefer that we wait several days before uh, they start their chemotherapy or that they wait several days before they start chemotherapy. So there's no confusion as to whether that inflammatory response is from the procedure or from the treatment. We also see that in patients with neuroblastoma who have very um, advanced disease, they tend to have a really profound inflammatory reaction. They tend to have some third spacing. And so for those patients, we may also wait. I recommend waiting a few days after the procedure before starting the chemotherapy. And so lastly, I'd like to turn to some considerations for ovarian tissue transplantation. Transmission of malignant cells remains one of the most important considerations surrounding ovarian tissue transplantation as one of the attendees inquired about testicular tissue freezing as well. And so this is a, an example of Miro's group showing how they have tried to address this. This is a 19 year old with a history of AML, status post ovarian tissue cryopreservation prior to BMT. And so when the patient wanted to use the, the tissue for fertility, the tissue underwent histologic and immunohistochemistry staining and was negative for leukemia cells. They then xenotransplanted the tissue to mice um, with severe immune, combined immunodeficiency syndrome. And they followed those mice for six months and they showed no macroscopic or microscopic signs of leukemia in the mice or um, in the tissue. So they performed additional testing, so uh, fish sequencing, next-gen sequencing to identify any molecular events that may be related to myeloproliferative disorders, and then they transplanted the remaining tissue back to the patient. The patient underwent ovarian stimulation, IVF, and delivered a healthy newborn. And at the time of publication in 2018, the patient was cancer-free. And so their group continues to use this technique of this sequencing immunohistochemistry staining to assess whether or not they're leukemic cells. Now you can imagine not every tissue sample will be assessed prior to transplantation because then they wouldn't be able to use the tissue. And so that remains one of the criticisms and concerns, but they have been able to show good outcomes using that methodology. In terms of transplantation, there are many options for transplantation. So orthotopic transplantation is preferred. So into the pelvis where the tissue was removed. This is a technique where we, are, we will create a peritoneal window and then place the tissue into that peritoneal window. This is another example of that. Some investigators will place interseed over that to stabilize the tissue. And then over time, the tissue is adherent and then the follicles, blood vessels will grow to the tissue within three to four months. And then the hormone, the tissue will continue to produce hormone and then ovulate. This is another technique that we, that I described earlier with the Doné and Mero uh, deliveries or live births. They decorticated the remaining ovaries to remove the cortex to allow for angiogenesis and then suture ligated the tissue to the cortex. This requires microsurgical technique, usually performed by mini laparotomy in the, or robotically. And, and Silber has described this technique. The other technique is to create these pouches in the ovarian cortex. And this is the technique that Moreau has described and then kind of pull those ovarian tissue samples beneath the cortex. The success rate is similar for the three techniques, the ovarian fossa, placing it on the remaining ovary or placing it in these pouches. And so either technique is feasible, whatever the surgeon prefers. Heterotopic transplantation is always controversial. Does it work? Does it not work? This was a first live birth reported by Kate Stern's group in Australia, 21 year old who underwent bilateral oophrectomy for granulosa cell tumor. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation was performed prior to the second surgery and the patient underwent histologic analysis to make sure that there were no signs of tumor. And then um, she desired transplantation seven years later after that histologic reevaluation. They transplanted the tissue to the pelvic side walls and the anterior abdominal wall, stimulated the patient, did attempt embryo transfer, but there was no pregnancy. 
They did a second graft several years later to the anterior abdominal wall underneath the peritoneum, stimulated retrieval, the patient underwent ICSI embryo transfer and did deliver a live birth. So it is feasible, although it is not used frequency, frequently and the success rates are extremely low. This is Silber's data on transplanting the tissue and restoration of hormonal function in the transplanted tissue. And they show that after about three to four months, the FSH levels uh, for those patients will decline and will decrease to less than 20. And they show in their hands graft survival of seven to 10 years. So we will begin to see more patients who are going to request transplanting the tissue back for hormone function. And we've actually had patients pursue egg freezing and then ask for ovarian tissue freezing because they also want to consider using that tissue in the future for HRT. There's a dilemma for those patients for whom transplantation of the tissue is not feasible um, due to the concern of the presence of malignant cells. And so this is a similar um, case where the patient, young patient, bilateral oophorectomy for cancer, they aspirated the follicles from the ovary at the time of oophorectomy and then took those follicles, matured them. Um, the patient underwent ICSI followed by embryo transfer and then delivered a healthy infant. So these follicles were already maturing at the time of aspiration. And so there have been several reports of live birth after IVM of growing follicles. We see this in patients with PCOS particularly, but there are no reports of live birth after in vitro maturation of primordial follicles, which really would be helpful for those younger patients who are not yet pubertal and don't have maturing follicles and don't want to undergo ovarian tissue cryopreservation. Over the last several years, researchers have been working to identify newer technologies to improve fertility outcomes in patients for whom ovarian tissue has been, um, ovarian tissue cryopreservation has been performed. So this is the ovarian tissue. Again, we described removing those immature follicles, conducting in vitro maturation, and then having the patient undergo IVF and ICSI. They are also looking at technologies to freeze and thaw the tissue. And then again, as we described, this is the standard technology at the moment, transplanting the tissue, spontaneous intercourse, and then conception. Or this multi-step tissue culture where the thaw tissue is then placed into a culture and the follicles are allowed to mature within the tissue. And then those maturing follicles are aspirated, undergo in vitro maturation, and then IVF. Or, ICSI. or taking this thaw tissue, extracting the preantral follicles from the tissue, and then placing those follicles into an alginate matrix de designated as an artificial ovary, and then potentially transplanting that tissue into the pelvis. What's really exciting is the idea of using pluripotent stem cells. And so we've talked about stem cells for many decades. So inducing these pluripotent stem cells, such as fibroblast stem cells, into these pre-germ cell-like cells, and then either maturing those into germ cells, IVM, ICSI, or placing this into a reconstituted ovary or creating a reconstituted ovary, transplanting that reconstituted ovary, and then IVM. So these are the technologies that are emerging um, for ovarian tissue that has been harvested from children and women. There are some limitations to ovarian tissue transplantation. We know that revascularization may take up to five days, during which time there can be a significant loss of follicles. The studies show that 50 to 90% of follicles may be lost at the time of transplantation due to ischemia and hypoxia. And there are also some limitations in terms of transplanting the tissue with leukemic cells. And they've been describing some techniques of kind of triple washing these follicles to remove the leukemic cells. There are other methodologies that are being proposed to optimize the potential of these cryopreserved tissues, um, including additives, so including um, stem cells, anti-mullerian hormone, vascular endothelial growth factor, antioxidants, and sphingosine 1-phosphate to help to preserve those follicles after transplantation. And then I've already described this this technique of 
taking the cortical tissue, maturing it in culture, removing the preantral follicles, further maturing those follicles, and then um, IVM and um, IVF. This just shows the tissue pre uh, stimulation, I'm sorry, pre culture. This is showing the tissue in culture and then removing the follicles. And then again, that, the creation of this artificial ovary that I described before. To optimize fertility, combining some fertility preservation procedures, so combining ovarian tissue cryopreservation with other technologies is also potentially beneficial. So Delatry and his colleagues conducted a study of 207 patients who underwent a combination of FP procedures, including controlled ovarian stimulation, consecutive controlled ovarian stimulation, ovum pickup with IVM, and then a combination of those therapies with removing an ovary, doing IVM, or doing ovum pickup from the vagina, followed by OTC. And then briefly, because I see that I'm over time, what they showed is that the best M2 outcome is with consecutive ovarian stimulation cycles, but they also showed that there was equal, there were equal results with ovarian stimulation and ovum pickup of immature follicles in the through the vagina. So placing the transvaginal ultrasound probe, removing those follicles, doing IVM, followed by ovarian tissue cryopreservation, removing the follicles from the ovary that has been removed and doing IVM. So they proposed that doing a combination of retrieval versus, I'm sorry, retrieval followed by ovarian tissue cryopreservation, retrieving the follicles from the ovary that's been removed and IVM may be a good option for patients who cannot undergo ovarian tissue simulation. So then lastly, some take home points. We know that OTC is feasible for patients at significantly increased risk of ovarian failure. There are over 200 births worldwide with a live birth rate of 29 to 41%. It is the only option for prepubertal females. We can use this for both malignant and non-malignant conditions and that transplantation may be considered after non-sterilizing chemotherapy. We are able to restore hormonal function as a benefit of transplantation and ultimately IVM may obviate the need for transplantation in patients at highest risk of reseeding. Lastly, Utilizing your regional fertility centers may improve access for patients who are at facilities that don't have REI services. And so lastly, I wanna invite everyone to the annual conference in Pittsburgh, May 2nd through 4th um, of the Alco Fertility Consortium. And so I will end there and I'm very sorry for going over. That was fantastic. I need to apologize, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Why don't we just uh, take a few minutes? Um, we, uh, for those who need a quick bathroom break, uh, feel free. Um, we'll start cases maybe at 2.40, but in the couple of minutes we have, if there are any questions um, for Dr. Apaya, that would be great. We can put them in the chat. In patients who who due to logistics are unable to, oh, that was a previous. Oh, question. that was a okay. different. Okay, okay. It's fine. Yeah. How many cases are you doing in Colorado? Like of OTC, would you say, since you've, you've been there, what now, three years? Yeah, um, two years. If two years. Yes, okay. Two years. Um, I would say we're probably at about two to three a month. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Month. Yeah. And we shipping did. out to Pittsburgh for processing. And yes, we've mm -hmm. done over almost, 375 consults in the last two years and the majority have been in males so we're doing a lot of sperm banking we're doing testicular tissue freezing for our males and then for the mm -hmm. females doing otc and um egg freezing so it's been great that's great right. build it and they will come that's yeah. right that <laughs> is so true them. that is so yeah. true so Thank you. I appreciate you allowing me to speak to everyone. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic overview. Gave us a really good perspective on not only the data, but also the technical aspects and also the pr procedural and logistical aspects. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Hi, Liz. Hi, Ivy. Good to see you. All right. All right. Well, enjoy All right. your cases. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.